Um, I want to start uh, by introducing myself. My name is Lauren Carter and just say a welcome to everyone to this, the second event in the pandemic response reading series. Um, I want to start uh, by recognizing that even though we're coming together from places across really the continent, um, Canada, as well as some from the US I see, which is great. We, these, um, this is a, a virtual launch, but these vast lands are the traditional territories of many first peoples. So even within this virtual realm, I think it's important to recognize that we are all treaty people with an obligation to work towards reconciliation. And so part of that for me is to begin by making that acknowledgement. Uh, to tell you a little bit about the pandemic response reading series, I started this to help bring some recognition to a lot of fabulous books coming out this spring that I realized when we began all this and started hearing about all the events being canceled wouldn't otherwise get any attention. And I just had such a huge empathetic response, um, knowing how important in my own career book launches have been as a chance to celebrate and connect with the community. Um, I just needed to do something. And so I started doing this. And so next week we have poets Claire Caldwell and Robert Coleman, both in Ontario, living in Ontario, launching two new books, Gold Rush and Democratically Applied Machine. And to register for that, you can go to laurencarter.ca slash PRRS for details. Um, just before we begin a little bit of housekeeping about Zoom, uh, to reiterate, you're on view only mode. If you wish to comment or chat together, we've already figured that out. <laughs> um, go to the chat function at the bottom. At the end of the event, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions, and those will be through the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen, or there will also be an option to uh, speak your question if you're more comfortable doing that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to that part of the night, the evening, evening where I am. <laughs> um, okay, so Joanna's book is one of those books put out by fabulous Turnstone Press that makes such beautiful books um, that really should be read far and wide. It's a hugely important book. And so it's, I'm really excited and thrilled to host this reading and this conversation, this discussion on this platform. So I'm going to start by introducing our moderator, Paul Pearson, um, and I'll just read his bio. So Paul is the co-founding editor and chapbook designer for the Olive Reading Series. His poems have appeared in Descant and Event and the anthology Writing the Land, Alberta Through Its Poets from House of Blue Skies. Raised in a mining town in the mountainous backcountry of southeastern BC, Paul has since relocated to Edmonton where he lives and writes with his wife and two children. We can look forward to his debut poetry collection, Lunatic Engine, which I love that title, um, which is being published by Turnstone. And it was originally supposed to be out this month, but like many other things, has been rescheduled until the fall. You can find him online at lunaticengine.com and at paulpearson.ca. And I'll just invite Paul to turn on his video and his and unmute himself and there he is. And I'm gonna sneak out of here now and go into the background. Welcome, Paul. Awesome, thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I just wanna start off by, by saying how honored I am to be asked to, to moderate this evening. Uh, I'm joining you from Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory, hi, hi. Uh, and, uh, and happy Earth Day, everyone. Also, welcome to the future. Um, if you had actually told me back in, uh, in the mid 70s when I was a kid that one day I would be sitting in front of a screen 
moderating a poetry reading and panel discussion with not only a poet and a couple of scientists, but with people from all over the country um, and beyond. I saw someone from from DC join uh, in in tonight. Uh, you know, my little Star Trek obsessed brain would have exploded. Uh, like this, this really is uh, a, a miracle of of technology. Um, I also want to say, though, welcome to the present, where so many of us spend a lot of our time sitting in front of a screen, even more so now that so many of us are working from home. Um, I had my first Zoom meeting this morning at, uh, at 7.30, uh, and I know a lot of us are in the, in the same boat. And not only are we using Zoom for work, uh, in many cases, we're using platforms like Zoom um, to connect with, uh, with loved ones, uh, either in other cities or even in the, in the same city. Um, it's it's uh, you know, the only way for us to sometimes see the faces of our loved ones during this, during this time. This is yet another reason why tonight is so cool. Uh, you've all agreed to get back online and spend yet more time in, in front of a screen. Um, and, uh, you know, trust me, you are not going to be disappointed uh, in, in that decision. We have three amazing individuals online who are, uh, are here to welcome you to the past. Uh, this is going to be such, uh, such a treat. We'll meet our three panelists in, uh, in a minute. Um, first, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of how this is going to work. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, and then when they're all on, I'm going to ask uh, them a few questions to get them warmed up. We'll then ask Joanna to read some poems from her fantastic new book, Endlings. Uh, we'll have a few more questions uh, and then uh, some more poems, which will definitely leave us wanting more. Um, and then we'll finish the evening with a, a question and, and answer period. There will be two ways to, to ask questions. Um, when it comes to that, you can either click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and type your question in, or you can hit the raise your hand button, um, which will allow you to ask your question in your own, own voice. And, uh, and Lauren is going to traffic control that aspect of, of things. So enough with the preliminaries, let's, uh, let's get this started. Um, I'd like to ask our first panelist, Victoria Markstrom, to, uh, to start her video and unmute herself and, uh, and introduce herself. Hi, <laughs> um, my name is Victoria Markstrom and I am a paleontologist at the Canadian Fossil Discovery Center down in Morden, Manitoba. Um, I specialize in Cretaceous marine vertebrates, and I'm here to talk to you guys about past extinctions. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us, Victoria. Uh, our second panelist tonight is Carrie Hamill. Welcome, Carrie. There we go. Had to unmute. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Hamill. I am with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and I'm the Director of Conservation in the Manitoba region. Uh, I'm an ecologist, uh, prairies and forests, um, and I've been fortunate to be able to work a good uh, part of my career on endangered species um, surveys and recovery activities, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. Thanks, Gary. We're excited to, to have you. Uh, we have some big brains in the room with us. Um, and finally, let's ask Joanna Lilly to, to hop on and tell us a, a bit about herself as well. Hello, it's amazing. Um, thank you, everybody. I've been seeing your names when you write comments. I see your names pop up, and it's it's amazing to see who's on this uh, who's on this event. So thank you so much for for joining. Um, I'm a little bit overwhelmed, <laughs> and I'm also overwhelmed by these amazing scientists that we have here because I'm definitely not a scientist. <laughs> so I'm slightly nervous they're going to start telling me what's uh, what what mistakes I've made in my poems. <laughs> Um, so I'm Joanna Lilly, and I'm in Whitehorse talking to you from my house. And I'm on the traditional territory of the Tuhan Quachin Council and the Kwanin Dun First Nation. And it's, yeah, fantastic to be here. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to hold my book up, I was told. So there you go. And you can see it. Paul has created this magical backdrop of the book as well as the Star Trek set. So I'm, <laughs> I'm completely impressed. <laughs> The miracle of, of Zoom, although our backgrounds don't look nearly as awesome as your background. Uh, <laughs> looks fantastic. Um, let's start with, uh, with a, a few questions to, to get us warmed up. Um, and, uh, and the first um, question I think we will uh, we'll throw to, to Joanna. Um, and it's, uh, you know, why this book? Why, why now? Yeah, it's a good question. So, it's been a sort of a long now, um, you could say. I first had the idea 
Um, it was actually in 2013. I was at Sage Hill. I know there's quite a few people here who uh, go to the Sage Hill writing experience. So I was there in 2013 and I was working on another poetry collection and I just suddenly had this idea to write a book just about, um, thank you, Carla's. I can see Carla's comment there, <laughs> yes. Um, just about extinct animals. Um, I think it's partly a very personal thing. I've always loved animals, always cared about them, always cried, you know, over dead animals and all those things. And then of course, in that I'm also a product of our culture in that we're living in the Anthropocene um, period where, you know, humans are now the, the sort of the major impact on the planet. And then um, more recently I was reading Justin O'Brien um, who's coined this term necrocene, you know, we're actually killing, killing our environment. So yeah, so it just seemed like the right thing to do for me personally, and then in the context as well. But yeah. Fantastic. Um, Victoria, the next question is, is for you. Why paleontology? Um, well, I've always loved paleontology ever since I was a young child. Um, and I love it because it combines a lot of different types of science. So you need, um, you need to know geology, you need to know biology and chemistry. So it takes a lot. Um, but you also need a lot of imagination and creativity. Um, you're trying to conceptualize these really amazing creatures that lived, you know, so long ago. Um, in a world that's completely different from our own. And I think that's really fascinating and intriguing. And uh, so it's really fun to use those different parts of your brain um, for your job. And I think I'm also drawn to paleontology because like other similar sciences like archeology span and geology, um, it's basically like a giant puzzle and we don't really know the picture. So it's this giant mystery and we'll never be able to know 100% what got, went on in the past. Um, but it's really intriguing and tempting to want to try and figure out even if it's just a tiny little piece. Um, and so that's why I, I'm kind of drawn to paleontology. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Carrie, are you sensing a, a pattern here? The question for you is uh, yeah. why conservation? <laughs> you know, it's funny, a very similar answer to Victoria. It's, um, it's a big connected world and uh, people are just part of this big ecosystem. Um, it's, it's such a big mystery, um, even though these species are alive, you know, on this planet with us right now, so many of them are undiscovered. Um, they're all products of, of, you know, sometimes millions of years of evolution and then they've um, such amazing features about them and, and, you know, you can spend a lifetime studying just one species or just studying how one thing interacts with another. So it's, um, yeah, it's really just a chance to, to be involved in this mystery and kind of uncovering some things and, and, and it's quite a, yeah, it, it's quite an uplifting thing, um, you know, except for the ones that are going extinct. <laughs> That's not fun. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Victoria, let's go back to you and, you know, based on your expertise, um, what have extinctions looked like in Manitoba and Canada's past and, and how do we know this? Yeah, so there have been many extinctions in the past and we can see evidence in the rock record and um, within Manitoba's rock record specifically, there are two extinction events in particular that are quite easy to see. Um, the first one being the Ordovician Permian extinction, uh, which occurred 455 million years ago, around that time period. Um, and this is when Manitoba was actually uh, really close to the equator. Um, it was a tropical environment and the tropical sea covered Manitoba. Um, and it was teeming with a lot of life, um, reef building uh, organisms uh, such as corals and squids, that kind of thing. Um, and then at the end of the Ordovician, uh, these seas started to dry up. And so what happened was, is um, a lot of these animals um, unfortunately lost their habitat. And so uh, we can see this in the rock record. And if you've ever gone to, um, uh, to places like Tyndall and uh, um, uh, Stony Mountain and everything like that, uh, you can see these packages of limestone and in those packages of limestone you can see um, the uh, diversity dwindling um, as you uh, head towards the Permian, Permian layers. So you can see that. The second and most popular or most 
uh, yeah, most popular extinction would be the Cretaceous um, tertiary extinction, of course. That's the one that killed off the dinosaurs, uh, which occurred 65 million years ago. And uh, there were a lot of different factors um, that led to this extinction, but the sort of the biggest thing was this huge meteorite impact. And when the meteorite impact um, it ejected this huge cloud of ash, and that ash you can see in, in Manitoba's rock record, it's this, this, this thick band of black ash. Um, and so those two are sort of the, the most uh, prominent extinction layers you can see in Manitoba. Wow. And so our extinction layer then is going to be a thick band of plastic that Pam yeah. and just are <laughs> going to unearth in the yeah, future. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, Carrie, so, so based on your expertise, uh, what factors are contributing to modern extinctions? Um, yeah, the, the biggest one and building on Victoria um, at a different scale, but it's, it remains habitat loss when species don't have a place to live. Um, it's tough to exist. So, um, and in particular, a lot of species on endangered uh, species lists are, um, you know, only live in one habitat or, or two types of habitats. So um, in Manitoba, there's like 57 species on our endangered species list. Um, but even though grasslands only cover about 4% of the province, more than half of the species on the list are, you know, live in grasslands. Um, there's just been so much loss of that habitat type that any species that needs grasslands to survive um, is in a bit of a, a, bit of a jam. There's certainly lots of other stuff going on. Um, when enough habitat's been lost, things like um, invasive species can really matter. Um, changes in, in water patterns, whether it's drainage or rearranging. People like rearranging water on the landscape in different ways. <laughs> and some species like that, but some don't. Um, but even, even where there's big preserves and parks, um, the challenge can be maintaining natural processes. So. Um, I love the, the poem in the book about the, the Rocky Mountain locust, but, you know, going back not too far into the past, you know, the prairies in Canada would have had, you know, herds of bison and, and, and regular fire and swarms of locusts, and there would have been lots of species that um, actually thrived under that disturbance regime. But those aren't around anymore, so for a conservation land manager, even to keep some of these species around, it's not just conserving land, but it's also trying to disturb it in a way um, to keep those things going. Right. I mean, when was the last time anyone had to pull over to the side of the road and, and squeegee the bugs off their windshield in the middle of a long road trip, right? Yeah, so, yeah, there no. seems to have been a decline. Are there any uh, good news stories? Are any species making a comeback? Are any conservation efforts working? There are, and that's, that's the really... And I'm glad you asked that question. There's quite a few success stories. Um, when people, you know, put in the work and put in the effort, um, it's usually hundreds of people over decades and decades um, an example here um, in Manitoba is the Smallway Lady Slipper uh, orchid. It's uh, um, used to be on the endangered uh, species list for 33 years, and it was recently lowered um, in its status to a lower level. It's still at risk, but that was because, in part, of you know, dozens and dozens of, of volunteers with a group called Nature Manitoba and other groups that, that conserved areas of land that had the orchid, that have continually managed the orchid to keep it around. Um, and essentially large um, numbers of them now are protected and well managed and that was enough to, to you know, to call it a bit of a win. Um, things like um, trumpeter swans and bluebirds, uh, a number of whale species, they've all um, come back uh, through hard work and, um, and that's, so, so that's the good news. You know, we, we have some success stories. I don't think we talk about them enough, but uh, they are around. That's great. Thanks. Um, thanks for that. Uh, speaking of hard work, let's, uh, let's turn it over to Joanna so she can share some of her hard work with us and, and we'll ask her to, to read a few poems. While this is going on as well, um, I think uh, the panelists, we're going to uh, kill our videos so that you can focus, uh, the participants can, can focus on, on Joanna and we'll be back um, uh, in, a, in a little bit with a, with a few more questions. So take it away, Joanna. Okay, thank you so much. That was really inspiring just, just listening to Victoria and Kerry. I kind of want to, <laughs> I feel sad that I finished, finished writing this and now I want to go away and write about all the animals that we are managing to save. <laughs> so, all these ideas popping as you were talking, that was lovely. So I'm going to um, read a poem about maybe the most famous extinct animal, the dodo, um, which um, I was lucky enough to meet, meet some dodos at Natural History Museum 
Um, and thanks to the Government of Yukon's Advanced Artists Award, I was able to go off to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, which was incredible. I could spend a whole year there. Um, and there was this dodo, you know, behind glass on, on one of their extinction displays. Um, I just felt, well, obviously very sad, but even more sad because it was covered in dust. So, I, so I've written a poem um, that's me trying to channel <laughs> what that dodo may have been feeling and thinking. So, it, and the dodo, I should say, went extinct. The last sighting was about 1662. Um, it lived on an island, of course, and it was killed off by humans landing and um, the dodo, as I think it, most people know, couldn't fly. So it was an easy, easy victim, easy food to catch. And they're quite amazing. Uh, they're about one meter tall, so they're quite big. I, don't, I didn't quite realize that until I started looking into it. So this is called the flightless bird of Mauritius. No, no, I have nothing to say, no need. Everyone knows me. There's no requirement to register, remark on what is already recorded. By all means, stare instead at the over-middened mower, my Antipodean protector, or the ivory-billed woodpecker, full-feathered forest dweller. What? Did you say there was a tree named after me? I would point out, perhaps, as you are looking, that this is not all actually me. I am bits of others a borrowed carpal, vertebral rib, a nursat's ulna. My maxilla and mandible are mine, my patelli left and right. I wouldn't be myself without my kneecaps. There's no mention of the size of my kneecaps, how I ran over rocks and roots across the palm savanna into ebony shade. Such injustice, necrotic silence. You like your lie, but I was clumsy, plump, and bumbled into nullity. If I were asked, thank you, I would only say there is no air here, just dust, this itching skullcap proving familiarity's neglect, and I cannot digest. I cannot form flesh to cover this ghastly cage. I need my gizzard stones. No one thought to pick those out of the mud on my hot island when they dug up my bones. You are not the only ones who need tools, who, without them, would be as obliterated as me. Okay, so that's the dodo. And then I'm going to read a poem um, inspired by my visit to the Manitoba Museum. So originally this whole event was going to take place in real life, in real time at McNally, McNally Robinson, the amazing bookstore, in independent bookstore, I should say, in Winnipeg. Um, so it was amazing that we're able to do this online instead. It's, it's just fantastic. And I get, still get to meet Victoria and, and Carrie and now Paul as well. Um, so this poem um, is called Skeleton City. And it's as I say, inspired by my visit, and it's about the um, Megatherium, which is a giant ground sloth or sloth, depending where you're from, how you say it. And it went extinct about 10,000 years ago. And it's one of those uh, megafauna animals where there seems to be, an. it would be lovely to hear from Victoria and Kerry about this, actually. There seems to be lots of debate about whether they were killed off by humans or if it was the end of the ice age and all these other factors, you know, shrinking habitats. Anyway, and now we'll get on with the poem. That's, these are very long introductions. So this is called Skeleton City. I wanted more time with my bones, my large wrists, the broad pelvis that rocked as I strode through a spacious brown town paled by prairie wind. I wanted the walk sign to be a skeleton, not dots. I watched two exchange control staff ahead of me, phalanges in their pockets, up to the carpus, male and female, both pulling the black fabric of their trouser seats across their backsides, sacrums loose in their yellow jackets, feet plantigrade, like the megatherium I'd just seen in the museum, heels pegged to stop it falling as it reached eternally for an absent tree. In the morning at the bus stop, a man raised his radius to shake my hand. I held his by my distals, hand signaling resistance. 
I gave him change. The bus driver let me ride to the airport, a dollar short of the fare. I sat, a telly against my suitcase, filleted by leaving a city that fitted so many moving bipedal parts. At the airport, I braced my wing bones against the wind between the bus and the terminal doors. One arm stretched behind me, fingers instructed to wheel my suitcase in, resist the impulse to let unnecessary luggage go. And you might be noticing I have some favorite words which jump out to me hugely now when I look at these poems. And I know I, I seem to like talking about kneecaps and bones rather than heart. So I'm gonna read one more poem um, before we go back to the conversation. And this one's um, for the Yukoners there. Thank you so much for being here. This would have been my White Horse launch day. Um, so it's just fantastic again that we can meet online and said, and invite all our friends from across the country. It's pretty incredible. So this poem is inspired by uh, a camel that actually used to live up here in the Yukon and Alaska and all the way down, I think, to Mexico. And um, it's a different camel from the camel that crossed the land bridge and went into Asia and became the camel that we all know now. Um, so, and also I should mention that I was very lucky to be able to visit the fossil laboratory in Whitehorse. Um, and I was even allowed to kind of pick up the fossils that they have there, it was quite incredible. So I'm very grateful to the uh, Greg Hare and his team there, it's amazing. So this is called Yesterday's Camel. Should I fly to Old Crow to find you, Arctic Camel? Here in this laboratory, weary of me, I put my finger inside the tube of your tibia and rasp the ripped cardboard above the smooth. I shouldn't remember the bamboo flute my father carved under the tarpaulin we strung up for shade on the beach in Spain. I want to think of you. You're the surprise, north as well as south, more Sahara than Lama. Your humerus is knuckled. I want to wrap my grasp around it, paddle handle, canoe the 60 mile, catch your bones from sloughing banks. Why must my human mind think tall? My father made bamboo necklaces as well. My sister and I wore them all the way home in England, all the way home to England in the van, loving their chunky clunking. I left my continent. You, camel, stayed on yours, cornered by the sinking Bering Land Bridge. I wish I had that necklace still and that Spanish shade. If I had the courage, I would slip your tibia into my bag and take it home to lay it in my box of useless, perfect, finished things. Thank you. Wow, useless, perfect, finished things. What a line, fantastic. Thank you so much. You. Uh, Victoria and Carrie, do you wanna start your cameras back up and come up off? off mute that's so. nice to see you all <laughs> <laughs> um so let's start maybe with a, a question for the three of you um and we'll kind of throw it uh, it open a bit you know we we know the stories of of the dodo and the passenger pigeon and the quagga and and so many other stories why do you think people take wildlife for granted hmm. just jump on in <laughs> uh, I think there is, um, they call it a shifting baseline, but each generation thinks the world is, uh, mm -hmm. the way they see it is normal. Um, so while the sky may used to have been full of, you know, a certain species of bird, and there's 50% less now, you know, the generation seeing how many birds there are now thinks that's normal. And, um, and then, you know, it declines a little bit more and the next generation thinks it's normal. And um, I even see that among conservation biologists, where they're just, uh, they're like, well, there's, you know, there's 500 of those species. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> but they used to be, you know, 800,000 of them or whatever. So I think that's part of it. I don't know the answer to, to that, getting people <laughs> to think beyond the span of a human lifetime. Yeah. 
Yeah, and to um, to bounce off that point, like uh, when you're talking about the past, and and when you're talking about like some species who have evolved over you know millions of years, looking back and trying to conceptualize those millions of years is you know it takes a long time um, to do that. It takes a long time to sort of readjust your brain into thinking on such a big scale, on such a, a grand scale. So it, it does take some time, um, and so. I think that's a, also another hurdle um, to get through. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Kerry, and expressed that so well about the shifting baseline and how we, yeah, how we, like the normal becomes the normal for us and we, we forget. I don't, I've been thinking about this a lot because I think sometimes we forget we're animals as well and maybe we're just, we're used to having animals and creatures all around us um, and we don't seem to realize the impact of our actions. And I'm really hoping that this pandemic one of the things i know lots of people are saying this one of the things that you know may come out of this is showing that we can change our behavior i know we're being forced to by laws to a large extent um but i there doesn't there's not a terribly amount you know large amount of resistance so i'm really hopeful that we can apply all of this energy and behavior change to to environmental issues as well when, and we're hopefully we're going to gather data that will help us really understand the impact it has had by not flying and not driving so much and all those things. Yeah, that's the key, getting past that, that shifting baseline and, and, you know, that age old question of how do we get people to act when, when we haven't been very good at it in the past. And, you know, do, what role does communication play in, in that? I mean, right now we're on this this amazing video platform where we can see our, each other's faces from, you know, across across the world. What ways do do our perceptions of our environmental crisis and these looming extinctions, you know, how are they expressed in the ways we communicate and, and um, can they help us uh, get over that, that shifting baseline? Again, for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think for, um... For conservation organizations and entities, it sometimes can be all doom and gloom news, but I don't know if that's an effective way to motivate people. Um, I suspect it's it's motivating to inspire people uh, to talk a little more about the stories of success, about what we have saved, about what's still around. Um, and yeah, just how people individually and the actions they can take in their life can make a difference. And and as Joanna mentioned, with this pandemic and changed behaviors, um, you know, undoubtedly it's going to have positive impacts on a number, a number of species. And um, having people feel less despair that we can't do anything about it, we really can. It might not be easy, but but we really can. Yeah. Victoria or Joanna, any any thoughts to add? Yeah, I think um, I think those are all good points. I mean, I think the lines of communication now can be both a blessing and a curse kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, we have so much, uh, our technology now, you can really easily sort of condense difficult scientific information and get it out to the public, like what we're doing right now. <laughs> but, you know, you do have to be careful in terms of uh, uh, the information that you get from online sources um uh, because you know there's a lot of um inaccurate sources out there um so uh you know so there is that sort of balance that we we need to 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 strike um to make sure that the information we put out there is accurate but also to to put out information you know as a scientist to put out information and to show our research so you know the public does get excited about it so the public can learn from what we're doing, you know, our research isn't supposed to be sitting on shelves and collecting dust. It's supposed to be useful. It's supposed to be used for the public. So new technology will will definitely help with that, but we just have to find that balance. Yeah. Awesome. Joanna, anything to add? I think it just makes me think about how we have all the facts. We have an awful lot of facts. We have an awful lot of information and and yet we still haven't changed our behavior on the environmental front. So I do feel that the arts is something that can really help people connect. And if we tell stories through different media, you know, whether it's poetry or fiction or visual arts, or theater, um, that we can kind of feel things in different ways and, and change our behavior that way and, and see that we can make a difference. 
Um, Cause we are, we seem to get very overwhelmed by information and then we seem to feel powerless. Um, whereas, yeah, I think a lot of people on the, on in this event are very creative, and and that's how how we can make a difference using those things, and just appreciate how how valuable they are and how important they are. You know, we're a species too, um, and yeah, we we're not just causing negative impacts on the planet. We're feeling we're you know we have a lot of positive impacts as well, or the potential to. Yeah, and following up on that, you know, we are animals thought too um and this is i think primarily for for joanna and carrie I, you know i grew up in the in the bush in in southeastern bc and and it was a heavy heavy hunting culture manitoba and yukon are both um you know heavy hunting territories as as well how do we reconcile hunting culture with conservation yeah i guess uh nature conservancy of canada we're a conservation organization our, our goal is to conserve species and ecosystems um but we've learned that, um, you know, people are part of the ecosystems um, and people that live around natural areas, um, often for generations or even millennia have depended on those natural areas for food security, um, whether it's berries or, or whether it's harvesting a deer. And that in, in general, people that um, get out onto natural areas, uh, connect with it, however that may be, including hunting, uh, seem to have a higher kind of um, awareness of changes in the environment and um, um, a desire to see, you know, ecosystems conserved and um, and those ecological processes maintained, um, which in turn, of course, can benefit, you know, your own, you know, your own food source or, or whatever it might be. Um, and that's something that we see, you know, all over the place is, is less people going out into nature. I mean, even if it's by law right now, but even before then. Um, perhaps having less and less of a connection. So I guess in the case of the hunting community, it's a group that's, that's very connected to nature. Um, and in some cases, they're pretty strong allies for conservation. And um, yeah, and bad news, birds aren't doing very well in Canada, but, but two of the groups that are doing well are waterfowl and water birds. And you can link that back pretty strongly to the support that um, organizations that conserve wetlands get from hunting groups and, from, uh, and even from fees on hunting stamps, for example. So it, it has made a difference. Wow. Joanna, are you seeing the same thing in, in the Yukon? Um, I, I don't have that kind of data, um, but it, yeah, I, it was really help, helpful to hear that. So I live in the Yukon, there's uh, 14 First Nations here and 11 uh, have settled their land claims, so they're their own governments. And I know there's, there's a lot of work going on and a lot of consideration for the environment. Um, I, from a personal point of view, this is a really difficult question for me because I, I'm very weary of all the killing that we do. And, and personally speaking, I include hunting in that. Um, you know, I haven't eaten animals for a long, long time, you know, since I was an adolescent. I feel that humans, I know we're omnivores, but we just need to stop killing for a while and let, let the planet recover. Um, however, I know, yeah, for example, as, as Kerry's been saying, and also First Nation cultures, there's a lot of respect for the animal as a spiritual being, and I'm deeply grateful for that. And I think we just have to stop, we have to stop treating animals as products in you know, factory farming and live exports and all those sorts of things, and, and just get some balance back, yeah. Yeah, it's about our relationship with the creatures around yeah. us. Yeah. You know, and then on top of conservation, you know, let's talk maybe a bit about conserving the, the past. and. Victoria, this is this is for you. I'm wondering what challenges challenges paleontologists face when trying to protect excavation sites from from intrusion and and pillaging, and and who owns the remnants of of our natural past? Yeah, uh, so it does vary uh, between countries, and I do know that there are certain countries that are having a large uh, problems with uh, we call it poaching um with uh with poaching and so uh it is a real problem for certain countries but from my experience here in canada and specifically here in manitoba um frequencies are quite low um so poaching and 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 pillaging is is quite low here um so in manitoba the province um are owned by the government um so the government of manitoba owns the fossils. So even if you find a fossil on your property, it is owned by the government of Manitoba. Uh, 
And this is to ensure that the fos fossils aren't owned by, you know, all the fossils aren't owned by one person um, and that they're available for all people of Manitoba. So they're available and everyone can learn from them and not just the person who found them. Um, so I, like other museums in Manitoba, ask permission from the government each year. So every single year I have to apply for a permit and ask them if it would be okay to collect fossils and keep the fossils in a museum on their behalf. Um, and so once they approve, I'm able to go out and collect uh, fossils with the landowner permission, of course. I wouldn't go traipsing on someone's property without their permission. Um, and so then, um, you know, I, I excavate, I clean the fossils, I keep the fossils, and I research. Uh, you know, I, I conduct my research. And so that information, the fossil itself and my research in information, is then put out to the public so that everyone can learn from the fossils that I, I collect and that I study. So um, that's the reason why we have those laws in place. Uh, and generally speaking, they work quite well. Um, I have seen a couple incidences of poaching, um, but typically the cases that I see tend to be um, misplaced enthusiasm. Uh, so they tend to be people who find a fossil on their property and they get so excited that they tend to excavate before calling us. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it is basically, you know, they're good natured people, really, really excited about paleontology, but, uh, you know, going about it in, in uh, not the best, not the safest way. Uh, so in that, those cases, sort of the best way to, to approach that is just to um, get more information about proper procedures and excavating fossils and, and uh, heritage laws in general um, to the public and uh, so that the public can learn more about it. Yeah. Wow. So on that, that note of public, I mean, what can we as citizens, what role can, can we play um, in making a difference for at-risk species, um, and maybe we'll uh, we'll start at the at the top with Joanna, and, and then go to Victoria, and then Carrie to answer that question. Gosh, so yeah, I I would actually love to hear from the other two, uh, yeah, on this one, um, yeah, if that's okay. Sure, let's go the yeah. other way. Let's go, yeah, Carrie, yeah. and then Victoria, yeah. and then Joanna. Yeah, sure. well, we have these, <laughs> these experts here. I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's lots. There's there's lots that people can do. Um, if you have a, even if you just you just have a, have a yard and it's it's all um, you know green lawn, and consider planting some native species, even just even just a few. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see when those native flowers uh, come out, the the, the butterflies that that co-evolved with those flowers um, are likely to come too if you have a natural area near you. And a lot of people kind of get hooked on it, and then they start making their whole yard more and more and more <laughs> as time goes on. And it and it's pretty amazing. And of course, as a bonus, the native plants can withstand droughts and floods and things like that and don't need as much maintenance. So, um, but do that at your workplace too. You know, ask your, your workplace, why, why do you have this lawn? Why, why don't you consider putting a native species in or ask your local government, you know, does the, your ditches, could they be native species? Um, um, you know, politics, you know, ask politicians how they, how they bring biodiversity and conservation into their decision making. Um, is it part of their, um, balance sheet when they're making a decision about something. Natural areas increasingly, this is the big trend in conservation, um, is to put a value on on nature. And, and I'm not sure what I, I think of that, right? The species on its own has so much value just to exist. But you can calculate, you know, the, the value of controlling flooding um, and how many houses it prevents from flooding. Um, how much carbon does an ecosystem put into the ground? Um, what are the pollination services to the crop next door by conserving a prairie? Um, so increasingly, you can actually put that into the economic book and say, wow, it would be less expensive to conserve this area than to, than to develop it. And uh, a number of groups, I think that's a big part of the future of conservation is, is talking to economists in language that they understand. Um, maybe less interested in conserving a certain, you know, insect or something, but, but <laughs> it might be cheaper to conserve a wetland than to build a water treatment plant, for example. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say is, uh, is, is just, you know, get into nature and, and, and bring some youth out with you. I think people value species in natural areas when they have a chance to see it, um, hear them, you know, smell sage in a prairie. Um, they, they never forget it and, and they're going to care when, when they hear about a development or they hear about a change in a law that might affect those things. But if they've never seen it, never smelled it, never heard it, um, it's mm -hmm. harder, I think, to motivate. 
fair enough. Expanding that definition of you know return on investment, social return on investment, natural return on investment, all of yeah, yeah. fantastic. Uh, Victoria, from the natural history paleontology point of view, what do you think? Yeah, uh, so um, obviously, uh, you know, my specialties are uh, animals who have since died. Uh, so there's nothing much we can do for them now. Uh, but uh, yeah, like basically just um, on the paleontological side, um, you know, um, looking at the past um, uh, and appreciating the past and seeing what happened. Um, and applying that uh, to the future. Um, that is something that's big in paleontology, especially now, especially with uh, our changing uh, climate. And, and uh, you know, so looking at past extinctions are, you know, is important to understand what's going on today. Um, and so if anyone is interested, um, I would say, you know, look at the past to understand what's going on in the future. Um, uh, but other than that, I think uh, Carrie did a great job, uh, you know, explaining the things that you can do right now to, um, uh, to mitigate the situation here. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Joanna, I think this is our last question before we ask you to, uh, to grace us with some more poems from the book. What are your thoughts? Um, I, I think it was wonderful. Thank you for, for what you have just said, uh, Kerry and Victoria. That's really inspiring. I think I just as a consumer, I suppose I would add that, you know, we, where we put our money has a big, a big effect. You know, if you can avoid products with palm oil, that kind of thing, I think that's really powerful and funding conservation organizations as well. And then just going back perhaps to what I was saying earlier, if, you know, if you have, if you have a creative sense and i love what kerry was saying about the you, you know how smelling sage you know you're using your senses and that's something that i think feeds very much into how we create and if we're writing or painting or dancing and all those things um and just connecting that way i think is really powerful and making it making the natural world part of our lives in in that way is is huge and really will stay hopefully you know that's a way for it to to kind of connect and delve into the generations and, and for the future as well. That's fantastic. Can you delve into your book a little <laughs> bit for us and read us a few more poems? I'll ask the panelists to mute their mics and, and, oh. uh, and stop their videos while we enjoy the poems. Okay, thank you. I have three more poems. Um, so this one, uh, it's called Specimen and it's inspired by the spotted green pigeon. So I do have poems about the big, you know, dinosaurs and the big woolly mammoths and that kind of thing. But I was really interested in finding species that perhaps um, aren't so well known or are just very small in contrast. Um, and we, d we know very little about the spotted green pigeon. It's also called the Liverpool pigeon. And we, there, were a, there were two specimens collected in, I have to look at my notes, um, well, in about the 1780s. And whoever collected them, didn't record where they found them on an island somewhere in Oceania. Um, and they ended up in England, of course, because a lot of the, uh, yeah, the landed gentry would send their collectors off to the colonies to take, the, take kill animals and bring them back for their museums. Um, so there were only two specimens and um, very little information collected with them. Anyway, so what I did in this poem, I sort of went off into a bit of a tangent um, as you may as you may discover so this is called specimen there will come a time when there are only two humans left in the world and they will be dead you perhaps and me we will have been shot and carefully cleaned we will be skinned all our creases and tears emptied of viscera our surfaces salted sulfured potassium carbonated we will be mounted, glassed in separate collections as far apart as London and Lincolnshire. No one will remember to write down where we came from. One of us will be misplaced. There will be only one human skin left in the world and it will be yours. Many won't believe you are a unique species. They will think you are a juvenile of an existing genus or a deviation. You will be taken to the World Museum in Liverpool. 
You won't have been to Liverpool before. You will never leave. Your legs, removed for stuffing, will be put back on the wrong way round. Someone will paint your glass eyes red because they heard that was the colour your eyes once were. After 200 years, there will be tests. Three short DNA sequences on the mitochondrial 12S gene will prove you are a distinct species, a specimen, moreover, of the legendary Homo sapiens from the Plastitronic age, alleged architect of annihilation. So that was my little fantasy. <laughs> and, uh, oops, I'm going to read um, a poem. Oh yeah, so this is um, the Tylosaurus, which was an amazing creature. And I do have to refer to my notes because I haven't remembered every single detail about all the animals I, I researched. It lived about 88 to 78 million years ago. Late Cretaceous period, Victoria, I hope I've got that right. Um, so it was this huge, huge sort of like a water lizard that lived in the sea that existed, um, I think, where Saskatchewan, that whole area, Alberta, are, it, it are now. Um, that, was, that was water. When you look at the continents before they reached their current formation. And what I love thinking about, which is another tangent, is how we think the world is going to stay as it is now. But of course it isn't. Um, the, the plates are moving perpetually. So this is just how it is right now. Um, so this was inspired when I visited the Royal Saskatchewan Museum in Regina and it's the Tylosaurus and um, the, the staff there gave it a Cree name, the Cree for hunter, which is O Machio, which is a, a lovely word. More shadow than bone, lavender phalanges projected on a pale wall. Ribs drip from a tangled riverbank of vertebrae. X-rayed mosasaur, stone-eyed, palm-holed, your lacquered bones hang in the perfect order of their burial inside an eroding hill. You sea swam, flipper steered and plotted, piggle caudal twists to cage seabirds, sharks, and plesiosaurs in your teeth and gulp. Omachio, hunter of the prairie sea. Your prey never named you. You were sea shudder on skin, scale, feather. You were unstoppable tide. Okay, the last poem. This is much shorter. Um, and it's about the Javan tiger, um, which unfortunately became extinct, definitely because of humans. Um, it was sort of listed as extinct in 2003. So this was from the Java, the island of Java. And I, but I did want to sort of leave on a, a good note. So the Javan tiger is one of, or was one of nine subspecies of tiger. There are six subspecies left. And according to the World Wildlife Fund, um, they're generally all actually doing quite well. They're generally stable. Um, there's a bit of not so doing so well in Southeast Asia, but places like India, Nepal, Bhutan, Russia, and China, tigers are doing okay. So I just want to, wanted to, yeah, not just be all doom and gloom. So this is called Beauty. There's a rumor about beauty. It's long whiskers and golden eyes. It's stripes as dark as the moon shadows of trees. There's a rumor that the forest took the beauty that the people who took the forest took the beauty. The beauty's stripes tightened, sliced right through. The people said they had nothing to do with it. The whiskers caught fire and the golden eyes burned right through. Thank you. Wow. Uh, yes, talk about burning right through. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, that is just a taste of, uh, of the book. Um, those of you who haven't had a chance to, uh, to read the whole thing yet, um, I'm pretty sure now that you're, you're going to try to run out and get it as quickly as possible. Um, it should be available at your local independent bookstores. Uh, I know many local stores are either offering free delivery or curbside pickup. Um, there is a link uh, to the independent bookstore map on the pandemic, uh, pandemic response reading series website. 
Um, I urge you, of course, to, to support local as, as much as you can. And links is also available as an ebook, uh, I believe, and you can purchase that on the Turnstone Press website at turnstonepress.com. Um, you can also pick, a, uh, pick up the physical copy there as well. Um, and uh, while you're there, uh, you know, why not get a book from another fantastic Turnstone poet? They uh, have lots of <laughs> great stuff there. Speaking of Turnstone, you know, I want to, to, to shout out and, and thank them for what they do, not just because they're also publishing my book, but because they've really been a, a stalwart, a pillar of independent publishing in this country since 1976. Um, that's, uh, that's a long time uh, being, you know, a Canadian place for Canadian voices. Uh, and we really, really um, love them. Uh, I want to thank you know Lauren Carter for bringing us uh, for bringing us all together tonight. Um, as she mentioned at the top, the pandemic response reading series uh, is happening uh, for the next uh, few weeks, um, almost every week, sometimes every every two weeks. Uh, I think the next reading is on the 29th with Robert Coleman and Claire Caldwell, who will be reading from their new poetry collections. And then on May 7th, our fellow Turnstone poet Sarah Enns will be launching her beautiful new book, uh, The World is Mostly Sky. That book has one of the most astonishing covers I've ever seen. I absolutely adore that cover and the, and the, the contents are great as well. Details for, for this uh, and other uh, events are on the Pandemic Reading Series Response webpage at uh, www.laurencarter.ca slash PRRS. And while you're on that site, I really encourage you to scroll down to the bottom of, of the page. It's a bit of a scroll, but, but I want you to go down to the bottom. And I'd like you to click on the, the link that says toss a few bucks into the tip jar um, yeah. to help support this, this reading series. Well, you know, many businesses are struggling right now. Um, Zoom most certainly is not. Uh, Zoom subscriptions do cost money. And I know that any spare change you can provide would, uh, would, would help keep this fantastic reading series going. Um, and it needs to needs to keep going. I think somebody mentioned earlier, you know, why why not do this even after um, mm -hmm. the pandemic scare is is over and we can go back to you know not being physically distant. We're going to move now uh, to the question and answer period. Uh, what I'm going to do, I think, I see a couple of questions in the Q and A section. I'm going to read those uh, for our panelists and Victoria and Carrie. If you want to come back on, um, we can uh, go through those questions. Uh, and then you can also uh, ask a question by raising your hand. We'll deal with the Q&A questions first, um, and then I'll switch it over to Lauren, who, uh, who will manage the, uh, the, uh, the verbal questions. So clicking on this, our first question comes from Kate, who says that Ali wants to know if it was hard to write the book and come up with the inspiration for all of the poems. Oh, hello, Kate and Ali. <laughs> In Whitehorse, thank you for being here. That's a really good question. Um, it was easy coming up with which animals to write about, because there's so many. Um, it was hard to stop, actually. But some of the poems, well, all of the poems, I had to do an awful lot of research. Um, I'm not a scientist. My background is not in the sciences in any, any way. Um, so I had to, yeah, I had to do lots and lots of reading and looking and going to museums and of course there's amazing uh, some some of the species that went extinct more recently there's amazing footage of them um so lots of yeah so that was hard but it was also it felt like a real honor to be able to meet these animals in different ways and then what i also had to do was because i'm not a scientist and it's supposed to be a book of poetry so i had to find the poem the story you know the emotion um and then build on that so yeah that that wasn't really difficult but it did it took a lot of time yeah yeah but it was a real joy yeah good awesome. question thank you indeed um cheryl next asks a question which she thinks might be awkward but i don't think is awkward at all um she asks can writers and artists leverage this new now mass slash ubiquitous digital realm that COVID has spawned to get more creative writing voices focused on nature and animals into the mainstream so that people will feel or connect more with them? I think there's a massive opportunity, definitely. Um, I really do. And I think a lot of, uh, again, the pandemic is maybe keeping us closer to home or at home. Um, so I think a lot of, I'm seeing online a lot of people connecting with the small details of nature. Um, which is really 
wonderful and inspiring and you know, listening to birdsong and, and flowers. Well, we don't have our flowers here in the Yukon just yet, but the signs of spring. Um, so I think that's really inspiring. Um, and the digital age is, is very powerful in that way. We can put a lot of pressure on society. Definitely, we can now directly contact people who are in positions of power. Um, I suppose my only caution is that, in my experience, I have to write what comes up from within. You know, obviously it comes from outside as well, but it, it's like, I can't really write with an agenda. It doesn't kind of go anywhere. Um, so you have to still find something, yeah, that, that's going to keep you passionate and engaged that you want to write about. And I think that's a really personal thing. And, you know, what I love about poetry is you can write poetry about absolutely anything, um, you know, a matchbox or doing the dishes, or, you know, anything at all. And I, I think that's what's so wonderful about it. So I would never want to impose an agenda on anybody, any artist or anybody at all. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Catherine, uh, another poet, um, was wondering if you could speak about your process, specifically how you entered the spirit of each extinct species. Yes, I want, what's Catherine's, is that, which Catherine is that? Thank That's you. Catherine Lawrence. I thought it might be, hello Catherine, <laughs> <laughs> from Saskatoon. Um, it was, it was different for each, each species really, so going to the museums really helped and seeing them. Um, as much as I could was really helpful. And then, like I say, sometimes it might be, a, like there's videos of the heath hen, black and white sort of scratchy videos of the heath hen before that went extinct, which is amazing. I listened to, there's some really heartbreaking um, audio footage of bird calls, you know, that, of birds that no longer exist. Um, sometimes I looked at other artists. There's an awful lot of visual art inspired by extinction, which is incredible sculptures and all, all sorts of different mediums. Um, so that was also very inspiring as well, seeing what other artists had done. So it was different for each one. Sometimes it was just reading a page on Wikipedia and delving into the details, you know, and then, you know, suddenly the, the kind of the thought comes. And I sort of, I tend to, a lot of poets don't do this, um, um, but when I write poetry, I seem to have to tell a bit of a story um, I think maybe that's because I started off writing fiction. I don't know. Um, so I would sort of try and find the little story in there as well. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. Um, our last Q&A question comes from Dennis, um, who, and I, I learned something just reading this question. Um, do you think poems about dinosaurs are a, dinosaurs are a distinct genre? Uh, just been reading D.H. Lawrence's Dino Poems, uh, and I had no idea D.H. Lawrence wrote dinosaur poems. I'll have to I'll have to go track those down um, earlier today and, and wondered what you thought. I did not know that. Now I have to go and read them. No, I think that's a wonderful idea. I think there should be a, a genre for every every species, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know D.H. Lawrence had written those, so that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, that might be a way to get seven-year-old boys interested in yeah, poetry as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that wraps it up for the the q a for oh no there there are more coming in um and uh if you if it's okay with you guys i'll just continue reading them um lauren i don't know if anyone has put their hand up uh to ask a question what do you, what do you hi think? guys um i see one raised hand so do you want to just briefly go to that sure let's let's and do then that. um and then we can jump back so uh let me just turn you on, Erna. Okay, there you are, Erna. You should be able to unmute yourself now and speak. But I think you have to unmute yourself. Are you there? I think so. I well, think there you are. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So, um, I, I had written the question, but um, this is kind of for Terry and, uh, and Victoria. The, the, Victoria, you're mentioning the Permian extinction is interesting because there's a lot of parallels between that extinction and the one where that period of extinction and the one we seem to be heading through right now with rising levels of CO2. And the impact on the ocean is pretty evident in ocean features. But Terry, 
how do you track something or can you even begin to track something like the impact that climate change is having on land species or is it just too amorphous and difficult to nail down yeah that's a good question the impact of climate change on on land species um it's been interesting in my career to see a response to climate change um, from the infancy of the science to, um, you know, um, I guess science at its core is all about um, understanding and reducing uncertainty and answering a question and moving on to the next question. So, yeah. so yeah, we have been figuring out slowly what's going on on land. I've learned it's very local though. So what's happening in the southeastern part of Manitoba and what will impact the species there could be really different on the exact same species in the Yukon or Alberta. Um, in some parts, you know, Canada it's getting wetter and other parts it's getting drier. Um, I think the one big difference on land compared to the ocean is a lot of what's happening with climate change really has to do with how people respond. So if an area gets wetter, the species may be able to handle that. But if the response of humans is to, to drain everything or put up giant berms or, or you know, whatever, that could be the, the thing that kind of gets the species. So, um, but yeah, so we're starting to learn, but um, I always avoid big sweeping statements. You know, climate change is going to do exactly this to the species on land. I think we really got to drill in and really understand, you know, individual species in individual locations. Thanks. I, I did a film on the impact of climate change on the ocean. So it's a subject mm -hmm. that really, really fascinates me and disturbs me and keeps me up at night. And so, mm -hmm. Joanna, thank you so much for writing this book. It's, uh, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. And the work that the two of, all of you are doing is, is uh, thank you very much. Fantastic, thanks, Erna. Let's, uh, let's go back to, uh, to the Q&A. Um, here's another question I think that we can ask all of our, our uh, uh, panelists tonight to, to answer. And it's a, it's a simple one. How do you stay positive? <laughs> Who wants to jump in and go first? <laughs> Crickets. Uh, well, it's, um, you know, um, it is difficult to stay positive with, uh, you know, a lot of negative news out there um, and um, trying to see the light in things. Um, yeah, it depends on the person. Some people are naturally more optimist than others. Um, so it does depend on the person. But uh, for me in particular, um, I try and look at the small wins as much as possible. So, um, you know, um, look at, you know, some of those populations that are, you know, bouncing back a little and, and you know, look at the positive impacts, you know, people are having um, around the world. Um, I just read an article in the Smithsonian Magazine about the gorilla populations in, in um, the Congo and how they're slowly rising up. And so it's those small things that you, that you need to kind of hold on to, and, and, or at least for me, um, I, I tend to hold on to to sort of push it forward. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it can be devastating. Um, <laughs> there's a increasing recognition of, uh, of the sense of you know, grieving uh, of those that work in the conservation field. And, and I'm glad to see it's getting a little more attention. It's hard. You know, we have, um, um, you know, properties at Nature Conservancy that we go to conserve, but if we don't raise the money fast enough and you drive by two months later and it's gone and all the species are gone and it's like oh we could have done something about it and, and it, it can be hard but have to focus on the wins and uh yeah and there's a lot of them it, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing the things that uh the small groups of people when they put their minds to things you know they can change zoning they can they can save parks they can save species and um you know it's harder at a you know as projects get bigger and a planetary scale it's certainly more complex but at least at a local scale, you know, there's a lot of victories if you start looking around. A lot of really neat things are happening. So, Joanna? 
Yeah, I think, yeah, it is, it is hard sometimes definitely to stay positive and I get an awful, I'm on a lot of email letters, um, newsletters, sorry, and a lot of them are, are very hard. I, I can't even read them. And then sometimes I get them where they are focusing on the successes and they're much, you know, it, you kind of need that inspiration, I think, to, to keep going. And also I just try and, I mean, one of the benefits of social media is that I can connect with groups of people who are doing wonderful things and see what they're doing and and i think that helps wait you know avoid the despair as well you know there are lots of good people out there doing amazing things yeah and i think that's that's where we have to focus and and even one small thing it's always worth doing that you know rather than it's so easy to feel overwhelmed but if you can do one small thing then that that's a huge that's what it's all going to get built on if we are going to change things yeah yeah, one step at a time. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I should have mentioned that that question was from from Leslie. Um, thanks, Leslie. Uh, our next question comes from Jennifer Eagle. Jennifer, hey, how's it going? I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, she asks, how much did this project fill you with sadness, hope, and anger? Uh, I'm wondering what types of these feelings you went through, in other words, and want to express to others. Yes, all of those things, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, the, like I say, the joy of connecting, like discovering a species um, and connecting with it and the marvel of it. And I should say, I mean, about half of the poems in this book um, are about animals that became extinct because of other extinction events or through evolution. It's not just a rant against humans. I really did want to go back beyond, you know, before we existed and just to discover the, the creatures that existed then um so there was a lot of joy in that i mean evolution is very natural and you know we're we're an animal too and we're evolving and what will humans look like in the future so i suppose i i tried to take that kind of view as well um i was going through um bereavements as well personal bereavements while i was writing this book so i think that almost helped me in some way as well process that because we all have a sense of grief um you know for what's happening to the planet and then we have our personal um grief as well so yeah somehow that's that seemed to help me um yeah but it, yeah it was it's all and i you know and i'm still thinking about it of course the book is done but you know i i kind of keep wanting to write about this and like i said at, near the beginning you know looking at how many species haven't become extinct because we did do the right thing you know i think that's that's really exciting too but yeah, an emotional roller coaster, definitely. <laughs> Indeed. Well, on that note, we have one last question, and I'd, I'd like to thank Kellyanne for for asking this question. Um, I am going to to ask uh, all of our panelists to to just respond to this, and and we'll end on a, on a positive note. So, um, you know, maybe starting with Victoria, the, the question is: What, if anything, made you laugh? Uh, about paleontology or just about paleontology or life or the book in the Joanna's book um, you know let's let's end this on a yeah positive. well I I really enjoyed Joanna your poem about Tylosaurus it's uh, oh. it's actually the animal that I'm writing my master's thesis on so wow. I had a bit of a chuckle there because I know I know Tylosaurus quite well and uh -huh. uh, and I've been uh, I've been working with Talosaurus pembinensis now for uh, five years. So, wow. um, you know, uh, getting to know him has been has been a joy, and, wow. and getting to know them, I should say. Um, and so, yeah, that gave me a bit of a, a chuckle hearing my hearing the subject of my thesis be uh, be talked about in a poetic way. I thought was was yeah, it was it was it was weird hearing yeah. it in a different style i'm always so used to hearing it in such a scientific yeah. way so it was really enjoyable hearing it from That's amazing. the other side yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you could spice up your defense a little bit eh yeah there you go <laughs> just have that other expert and i love i love the, the name for talosaurus the the yeah. name um, yeah. you know that was That's really, amazing. yeah yeah so that, i thought that was a really good, good good name for him yeah Carrie, what about you? Um, I've been waiting for just the right moment to show you these life-size cutouts of the most endangered butterfly in Canada, the Powashik Skipperling. And uh, so that made me laugh that I finally have a moment. Yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so 
there's less than 500 of them. Half of them are in Canada in a very small area just in southeast Manitoba by a town called Vida. And, uh, really? But people are working hard. I was on a call today with people from across the country who are working their butts off to try and save this thing. So I have hope. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Your hope gives us hope. <laughs> Joanna, what, uh, what made you laugh? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I think maybe I've sort of tried to sneak my pets into some of these poems, which not deliberately, but, you know, it's just inevitable. Um, so that's been quite fun. And, and sort of, yeah, looking at the poem and thinking, oh, realizing that that's what I was sort of doing. So that's that's been quite nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I do the dedication for the um, the dedication for the book is is a list of <laughs> pets that I've had. So <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that but then I suddenly realized not that long ago I missed out a couple of uh, hamsters so I'm feeling quite devastated about that. Oh, <laughs> the poor hamsters always the getting hamsters overlooked. I didn't make it. It was very I sad. Tell you. Wow. Thanks for the question Kellyanne. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn things over to to Lauren with you know with my thanks again for for the honor of doing this, and maybe ask Lauren what made you laugh. What made me laugh? Well, I was going to ask you, Joanna, just now about that list at the front because I thought it must be all of your creatures, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything offhand, but. Um, definitely loved this evening loved all of this conversation and and all of you guys coming together and sharing this um it was just amazing it was so great to yeah. sit back and and watch yeah fantastic thank you yeah so much lauren for making this happen and to all of you yeah it's brilliant yeah, yeah. you're so yeah. welcome yeah so yeah welcome. It was thank you for everybody who came as well and yeah and all those wonderful questions yeah, they were great questions. Yes. And yeah, so um, more events coming up, lots more. Please go to the website and check it out. Uh, laurencarter.ca slash PRRS. And also we have a Facebook page too that you can like. And do, but yeah. do uh, buy Lauren a coffee at the end of the page if you can. Yeah, that's appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.